Uh, now, about, about the first keynote, so Rafael Dosling, an assistant professor from uh, Monash University in Australia, will give a talk about privacy preserved machine learning. So, Rafael, I got to know him back in 2013 or 14, I think, when he was still doing his PhD in cryptography at uh, Country Institute of Technology in Germany. Since then, he has changed quite a few places, like he, he he was doing his postdoc at Aarhus University in Denmark. Then he moved to Israel, uh, Belilah University, where he was doing another postdoc. And lately, he, he got a position as an assistant professor at Monash University. So, uh, Rafael, he has published in top conferences in crypto. And during the last two years, I think he has been working mostly on privacy preserving machine learning. Um, and then I'm looking forward for his keynote speech. As Anton has already mentioned, uh, today we'll be talking about privacy preserving machine learning, which is uh, the topic that I have focused most of my research in the last few years. Okay, we all know that uh, machine learning is a very powerful tool. It's, it's the field of computer science that has uh, evolved the most in the last 15 years or so. I mean, of science in general, I mean, and uh, the power of machine learning is that it enables uh, to automatically learn from huge amount of data uh, and make sense of uh, complicated questions in the world that uh, we otherwise would be tough to handle these questions, right? And uh, it has the potential to vastly improve uh, our daily lives in many ways. I mean, it can help diagnose patients and uh, personalize search engines and recommendation platforms like Google, all these recommendation platforms, and so on. Also for self-driving cars, which are upcoming now, and uh, they use a lot of machine learning techniques uh, for that. You can also optimize healthcare spending. And I mean, that, that are so many use, uh, important use of machine learning that I can mention all here. But yeah, it's a very powerful uh, technique, set of techniques. But there is one uh, big dilemma there because uh, traditional machine learning methods, uh, they assume that all existing data is available. I mean, this machine learning techniques, normally they are very hungry for data. They, they try to get as much data as possible and they work well when they have, uh, normally they start to work better when they have much more data, right? So you, you wanna, you would like to train them on uh, as much data as possible to get the best accuracy and so on. But in many cases, the data that is needed to train the models, uh, they are owned by different parts. And uh, sometimes there are privacy issues that, uh, that is legislation uh, that prevent the parts from uh, sharing that data that they have, or they have financial incentives not to share the data with the other parts because I mean, the, the data is valuable, right? So they don't want to just review the data to the other parts. And even in the case that uh, you already have a machine learning model, let's say that uh, Google has a machine learning model to predict some disease. And uh, I mean, this model is very valuable. And uh, on one hand, the user, maybe it's not uh, willing to disclose uh, the data to get the result of the scoring according to that model. But on the other hand, uh, the model on don't want to review the model to everybody, right? So even if you already figured out how to do the machine learning training and get all the data, even for doing the scoring of the models, uh, there are privacy issues between the model on and the user. So for instance, in uh, privacy preserving learning, uh, you can have like a, a hospital, a healthcare provider here, and uh, they have different kind of, uh, I mean, the insurance company and the hospital, they have different kind of data about the different users. And uh, if they combine the, the data that they have, uh, then uh, maybe they'll be able to train much better models, like to predict the cost of healthcare, to predict the chances of uh, one patient being admitted to the hospital in, uh, let's say one month or so. So, I mean, they can do a better job if they put that data together. But the data that they have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, can be confidential or can be valuable data that they don't wanna 
to review to the to each other. So that's the problem we get. We want to do privacy preserve learning. They cannot or we do not want to share the data, but they want to jointly compute just the result, the model. Or in the case of privacy preserve scoring, uh, the hospital may be have some model to predict the disease and then Alice goes there and uh, she wanna know uh, what are the chances that she will have the disease or not, but she don't want to review all her health data to the hospital. And the hospital of course not review the model to Alice because it was trained on uh, health data from many users and uh, it's private data, right? So both parts, uh, again, in the privacy specific code, they want to guarantee the privacy of uh, their data. I mean, okay, so what can we do to solve this privacy dilemma? Uh, there are crypto tools that uh, can be used to obtain privacy guarantees. So some of the tools that have been used uh, for privacy present machine learning include uh, fully homomorphic encryption, differential privacy mechanisms, and secure multi-part computation. And they provide kind of uh, different guarantees, sometimes even orthogonal guarantees. So you, for instance, uh, differential privacy and secure multi-part computation, normally they provide quite orthogonal guarantees. So you have to figure out what is the scenario that you wanna use, what are the privacy guarantees that you need in the scenario, and then uh, look for the appropriate cryptograph tools uh, to obtain the kind of uh, privacy guarantees that you need. And uh, today I will be talking mostly about uh, privacy preserved machine learning based on uh, secure multi-part computation which is uh, the focus of my research in the last few years. So, okay, so let's go back to the scenario that uh, we have uh, the insurance company and we have the hospital, they want to somehow uh, put that data together to train a joint model that's better, but uh, without revealing that data to each other. If we magically had a, a trusted third party, uh, like uh, both parts could just review that data to this trusted third party that would announce the result of training the model and uh, delete the data. So it would be safe, right? But uh, that's not a reasonable assumption. And uh, what MPC protocols does is actually, it was a result that was showed back in the eighties, uh, initially by Andrew Yao, which, actually got the Turing Award among all the contributions for starting MPC. MPC shows that uh, it's possible to secure performing this uh, joint computation without revealing anything other than the output and without needing the trusted third party. So it's a set of uh, cryptographic techniques and protocols that you use so that uh, you just get the output uh, the functionality that you want to compute, but nothing else is revealed to the parts. Okay, so and uh, today I'll be focusing most on the, one of the MPC techniques, uh, which is called uh, secret sharing. And uh, I'll be showing how to do computation using secret shares. I, I, I'll not show a secret share scheme right now, but in a few slides, I will open up uh, some examples of uh, secret share schemes. But the, the overview of the technique is the following. Like if, if you have many data ons, what they do, they convert that input data to integers, modulo some uh, number Q. So, the, so they are like numbers in a finite field or in a ring uh, in uh, the mathematical structure that they use. And uh, then they secret share to the computing parts. And the guarantees of the secret sharing scheme is that the adversary, if uh, let's say that, uh, that the data owns a secret share that inputs each one uh, to Alice, Bob, and Carol. So Alice got a, one piece of information, Bob got one piece of information about the input, and uh, Carol as well. But uh, the adversary, if he controls one of these parts, for instance, he will not be able to uh, recover the, the original information. But if uh, the parts collaborate among themselves, they can reconstruct the secret sharing to obtain the, the original value. Okay, so this, why, why is this not working? Okay, now it goes, okay. Uh, okay, so then in, so the initial step is that the data owns, they secret share their input data to the computing parts. 
And sometimes the data owns uh, can be the same uh, parts as the computing parts. So maybe in the case uh, here, uh, could be like the data owns would be Alice, Bob, and Carol themselves. But the secret share the input data to each other, data owns to the computing parts. And then this, in the second step, you do the computation in a secure way uh, over the secret share value. So no, no information at all, it's uh, leaked to anyone. And in the end of this second step, you get secret shares of uh, the representation of the model. And then uh, if all parts collaborate, then uh, can uh, reconstruct the secret shares correspond to the output in order to deliver the, the model to whatever part uh, needs to learn the model. I mean, if one part is authorized to learn the model, then all the computer parts you just review the secret shares of the output to that part and uh, that part can reconstruct the model. So that's the overview of the techniques. And I will enter into the details of uh, secret share schemes in a few slides as I mentioned. Okay, so, but, okay, so what we get here is this uh, mathematical structure of uh, the secret sharing schemes and uh, essentially what is shown uh, since the eighties is that, okay, if, you can compute pretty much any function because uh, you pick the function and you express the function uh, as addition and multiplication gates or alternatively as under and short gates and then you use MPC schemes uh, to compute the secret that uh, consists of addition, multiplication gates or under and short. But I mean, for efficient reasons, uh, normally you want to optimize many of the important operations. You don't want to just pick uh, whatever representation of the circuit and uh, compute it because then you don't get the most efficient solutions. So you want to optimize uh, especially like important operations that are used uh, over and over like secure comparison, secure linear algebra operations and so on. And uh, another issue is that the operations, some of the operations like secure comparison, it's easy to perform in a binary field. While all the operations like linear algebra operations, they are better to perform on a, a field Q with a large value, I mean, a big field. So you get all these uh, important questions of uh, which underlying uh, mathematical structure you use for your secret share scheme. So that's one important part to consider. Also, you have to consider the setting that you are into. If you consider that uh, the adversaries are same honest and they follow the protocol instructions and uh, try to learn additional information but following the protocol instructions, or if they are malicious and don't follow the protocol instructions at all. And uh, how many computing parts uh, you're gonna use and uh, how many of them can be corrupted. All this uh, choice of the setting that you are doing the computation, they influence the underlying MPC scheme that you should use. And uh, let me just briefly that if you really want to get efficient solutions for private present machine learning based on MPC, it's often the case that you need to make the, uh, the machine learning techniques uh, more MPC friendly. So, I mean, in principle, we know since the areas that are, okay, it's possible to do that using MPC uh, because you can express as a general circuit and uh, computer using the MPC. But uh, if you want to do it efficiently, then that there, there are many questions that need to be investigated uh, for the specific uh, so problem that you want to solve and setting that you are considering. Okay, so let's uh, move on. So. I mean, using MPC for private space and machine learning is a very hot area. And uh, I mean, you got like dozens of uh, papers appearing top venues in security, in, uh, in security conferences in the top four, in the, in the top machine learning conference and so on in the last few years. And uh, they'll treat uh, topics like a train and score of uh, neural networks is quite hot right now or linear regression, how to do that very efficiently, how to train uh, privacy preserved tree assembles uh, with uh, continuous value, uh, continuous attributes as well, how we can do privacy preserving video classification and so on. I mean, it's a very hot topic and uh, I have contributed many of these topics, but today I will focus on uh, one very specific point, 
Let me just briefly mention that a lot of progress is happening in the last few years as well on the underlying MPC schemes. So the underlying MPC schemes that we use to perform these uh, computations of uh, the machine learning techniques, they are evolving quite a lot in the last five, uh, six years. Okay, but but one thing that I'll be focused today is the following. Okay, if you look at all these uh, works that uh, have been appearing in the last few years, in general, the case is the following, like privacy preserving machine learning solutions that we have nowadays, they mostly assume that the data sets needed for the training, they are read for consumption. So you, the data is uh, read completely clean and organized and you just pick the data and uh, do the secret sharing or garbage uh, secret that you, whatever MPC technique you wanna use and uh, you run the MPC. But in practice, that's not how things work, right? In practice, uh, much of the work is done before the training. Uh, you have uh, to clean the data sets and pre-process the data sets. And uh, if there are missing values, you need to somehow address uh, what you do with these missing values. If there is continuous data, you must discretize the data sometimes to do your computations, right? Uh, sometimes you don't want to train using all features, so you must select which uh, features you use during the train and so on. I mean, I mean, uh, actually, if you look at surveys, uh, data science uh, people would sometimes say that they spend more time doing like this uh, data preprocessing than the training the, itself. Uh, it's a lot of work that goes on the data preprocessing phase. And after the, the model is trained, uh, you also have to validate the model and possibly fine tune the model. So there is a lot of work that are going on, that needs to go on, but uh, all the solutions that we have seen, they most focus on uh, the training phase and the scoring phase, not on the data preprocessing and uh, fine tuning and so on. So today I will be talking mostly about uh, this uh, work that we had uh, together with Xing Li and uh, Martin de Kock. It's called uh, Privacy Preserve Feature Selection with uh, Secure Multipart Computation and just appeared on ICML this year. So essentially what we got there, we were considered like the data preprocessing step. And we got the first MPC based uh, protocol for privacy preserving feature selection, uh, which is our solution was based on the filter method, which is independent of the model training, and it can be used in combination with uh, an MPC protocol to rank features. So you can use this filter method uh, to filter the features that will be used, no matter which method you use during the training phase. So it's independent of the training phase itself. And how you score the features uh, to be used in the future filter method, uh, you can use many techniques to score features, right? But we'll present an efficient feature scoring uh, solution uh, based on the gene input uh, technique. And uh, we show that a secure feature selection with uh, the proposed protocols, they improve the accuracy of classifiers on uh, many real world data sets. Of course, we shows the data sets before doing our work, otherwise wouldn't have any meaning, right? Just pick the data sets that work for you. No, that's not how things work. We pick some uh, expressive uh, real world data sets and uh, show that this kind of technique actually uh, improved the accuracy uh, that you're getting the final solution. And the important thing here is that we do this uh, feature selection without leaking information about the feature values or even which features were selected uh, to be used during the training phase. Okay, so, so let me just put some uh, notation here. So we assume a data set S uh, that has M uh, training examples uh, and each training example consists of uh, an input vector X1 up to XP and a corresponding label Y uh, which possibly can be one out of n uh, possible classes. 
Okay, but uh, that's your input data. But uh, probably not all the P features, they are equally beneficial for training machine learning models. So often it's the case that you want to first select the features uh, that are more, more expressive for more beneficial for training machine learning models and then uh, train the model just on that set of features, subset of features. As this can uh, improve the accuracy of the model, and uh, of course, this improves the efficiency of the model training, especially if you want to do in a privacy preserving way. Because doing training in a privacy preserving way, it's uh, of course nowadays much uh, more expensive than doing uh, training in the clear. Okay, so uh, in this future. Um, approach that uh, we use for the feature selection now features are first assigned a score that's indicative of uh, their predictive ability and then only the best scoring features are retained so that's the main idea you will score the, each feature each of the p features will get a score based on the data set that you had and uh, you keep uh, the best one the k best ones let's say Okay, and uh, well-known techniques uh, to score features in terms of uh, the information that they can provide for the model training, how useful it is. They include mutual information, uh, gene input, which is the one that we consider. We, we provide efficient solution for gene input, but also you can use mutual information or Pearson correlation coefficient. These are common uh, techniques uh, to score the features. And in the case of gene input, uh, the computation of uh, a gene input score for continuous value features, uh, the tradition requires sorting of the feature values to determine the candidate split points in the feature value range. But if you want to do like oblivious sorting, sorting in a private space every way, it's a very expensive operation. So we instead propose to use a modification of the gene score, which is the mean split gene score. You pick the, the, the mean value of uh, the feature as the splitting point. And uh, so you avoid the oblivious sort of operation. And uh, we will actually show that uh, this mean split gene score uh, leads to accuracy improvements that are on par with the ones obtained with the other techniques like gene input to PCC or mutual information. Yeah. So uh, let me just measure. Uh, uh, something about the adversarial model before moving to explain the 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 the, the secret shared schemes and everything. So I mean, our, our solutions they are generic enough that they can be used uh, with any underlying MPC schemes, and so they can support cases where the majority of the computer parts are honest, uh, the majority of the computer parts are dishonest, and uh, so on. But and also adversaries that are same honest or malicious ones. But the underlying MPC schemes will need to change depending on the setting that you consider. And uh, if you're interested in uh, privacy preserved machine learning based on MPC, you notice that a lot of the solutions they use this. So the setting where you have three computing parts and at most one corruption. Because uh, the MPC schemes uh, for this setting they are very efficient. Uh, for instance, the scheme by Arak et al. that appeared on CCS 2016. So we have, we have evaluate the runtimes of our protocol in this honest majority TRIPC setting, which is probably the most popular in privacy present machine learning literature right now. And, uh, but we also look at uh, the case of uh, malicious adversaries uh, that not necessarily follow the protocol structures. They can deviate from the protocol structures. And uh, we will we'll take a look at the uh, malicious adversaries in this uh, three PC setting, but as well on the four PC setting with one corruption following the new scheme by Dalskov at all that appeared on Usenix a uh, few months ago. Okay, so what is this uh, secret share scheme? And uh, the secret share scheme is the specific one that we will consider that is used by all underlying MPC schemes is the so-called uh, replicated secret sharing. So let's see how you create a replicated secret share. If you have an input value, let's say X, and you want to create a secret share of it, 
you can pick uh, uniformly random values x1, x2, and x3. But this, I mean, these uh, values are uniformly random, but subject to the constraint that uh, the sum of x1, x2, and x3 is equal to the original value x modulo q. And now what do you do is the fuck like you give uh, x1 and x2 to Alice, uh, you give to Bob x2 and x3, and to Charlie you give x3 and x1. So what are the properties that we got now here? And we are in this setting of uh, same honest uh, adversaries that follow the protocol instructions, but try to get additional information. And we are in the setting of uh, three parts with uh, one co-option at most. So what we get here is the following. The first important property is, the, okay, we are assuming that we have at most one co-option. Uh, this secret share scheme, the way it was done, we have this very important property that any single part cannot learn any information at all about X, given its share. Since the, the, the three shares, they are uniformly random, just subject to the constraint that the sum is equal to X. If Alice, for instance, has uh, X1 and X2, she don't have any clue about uh, what is the value of X3, so she don't have any information at all about the original value X. The same holds for Bob and Charlie. And of then alone, uh, they don't have any information at all about the value that was secret share. But if, if two of them get together, then they can uh, they have enough uh, shares to reconstruct the original value. So one of the parts alone cannot have, don't have any information at all. Two parts together, they, they can reconstruct the original value. And one nice property of this kind of uh, secret share schemes is that is uh, very easy to perform uh, addition of secret share values in a local way. They don't have it even to communicate among themselves. So if, for instance, uh, let's say that there are two values that were share, like X and Y, and uh, Alice, uh, Bob, and uh, Charlie have the corresponding shares of X and Y. Now, if they want to uh, obtain a secret sharing of the sum of uh, X and Y, they can just uh, sum the local shares that they have. They don't communicate at all with each other. and. Uh, now they have a replicated secret share of the value x plus y. Okay, and uh, it's also very easy to add a constant. Uh, if you want to add a constant to the secret share value, just pick one of the parts, let's say Alice, and she adds the constant locally to the, the secret share x1, and uh, whoever else has the, this, uh, this x1 can also add, right? And it's easy to multiply by a constant. Uh, but the main problem, uh, the, the one that is more demanding is normally when you want to multiply two secret share values. Okay, the main advantage of uh, replicated secret share schemes is the- Raphael, uh, can, can I ask something? Raphael, can I yeah. ask something? Yeah, because if I wait until the end, I think, you know, I will forget. So, okay, can sure. you go to two slides back? Yeah. Right, so anyway, here, it doesn't matter. So yes. yes. Here. So, so basically, yeah. you know, you need to generate these random values, x1, x2, x3, uh, where the sum of them will have to be equal to x, which is your secret, right? Yeah. Yeah, now all parties, Alice, Bob, and Charles, uh, they, they, they generate these random values independently or how, I mean, so, so whoever whoever owns the data, the data owned for this value x, uh -huh. he'll be the one doing the secret share. Right. And so uh, even the can, data owner, can, the data owner is the one doing create the original secret shares, right? Right, right, right. Okay. And, I, I, uh, that, right. I mean, so in principle, I mean, they would generate uniformly at random the three values and send to each of the computing parts, right? I mean, because the data owner can be maybe one of the computing parts themselves or can be external, right? A lot of this is, uh, out, a lot of the solutions, they work in the outsource model where the computing parts are not the same as the data owner. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I mean, in principle, the data owner will generate the three values and uh, send the three values to the corresponding parts. But if you want to improve the efficiency, uh, what you actually would do, it's uh, you can have, uh, I mean, every two part, 
the part of uh, Paris, like the data on, uh, can have a common uh, PRF key, pseudo random function key, together with the compute part, and uh, just like uh, generate two of the values just by using a PRF, and the third one can be just adjusted to match the original value. So, uh, so that you save like two thirds of the communication, essentially. Right, right. Okay. So in practice, that's what you do. But I mean, I, I don't. I don't do the tricks here because it, otherwise it would just complicate the presentation. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank. Thanks. Clear. So yeah, if you have any other questions, just let me know. It's easier to just explain them on the spot. Okay. So okay. So you you can easily like add secret share values locally without communication, multiply by a constant, and. Uh, Add a constant. Uh, these are all easy operations to do locally without having to communicate with each other. But uh, you sometimes sometimes you have to multiply secret share values, right? Because if you are expressing like your underlying computation as uh, sums and uh, multiplications, then uh, sometimes multiplication of uh, secret share values will have to happen. And in this particular case of uh, the replicated secret sharing. Uh, one good property of this scheme is that uh, there is a very efficient procedure for doing one level of multiplication of secret share values. And that's the reason why these most efficient uh, MPC schemes, they are often using these replicate secret sharing schemes. So what is going on is the following. Like you suppose that you have these two values here, X and Y, that were secret share. Now you want to compute the multiplication of them. And if you open the expressions, uh, I mean, x1 plus x2 plus x3 times y1 times y plus y2 plus y3, I mean, this is equal to these uh, nine terms here that you have in the sum. And the nice thing, if you take a careful look here, there are three terms there that just depend on uh, things that have index uh, one and two. And this can be locally computed by Alice. There are three things there that only depend on uh, things with uh, index two and three and can be locally computed by Bob. And the three other ones just depend on uh, things with index one and three and can be locally computed by uh, Charlie. So you can do one level of multiplication in a local way without having to communicate at all with the other parts. So if you do this one level of multiplication in a local way, what you get you obtain a Z1, Z2, Z3, which sum to the value that's equal to X times Y modulo Q. But now you don't have a replicated secret share anymore. You have an additive secret share. It will not allow you to do another level of multiplication. So you, you somehow have to come back to this replicated secret share representation in order to be able to do another level of multiplication. And okay, so they just, between the adjective secret share of X uh, times Y. And now what they do, like if first they, use, they will add a value using like PRFs, they will add a secret share of zero. That's for specific uh, secret reasons, which are not entered into details, but uh, they'll just add you a secret share of zero here and obtain U1, U2, and U3, which some, uh, it's equal to the product that we want. And uh, then, okay, then they have, uh, this, I mean, each part has one share and now they communicate like uh, each part will send one share to one other part. So there will be three uh, elements that will be sent one by each part. So that in the end, they get it back to the replicated secret share uh, representation. So that, that's essentially like uh, how you get back from the adjective secret share to replicate secret share presentation. Okay, in the case that uh, the parts are malicious and they can deviate from the protocol instructions, there are some few other things that need to go on here in the underlying MPC scheme. So you have to add information theoretic message authentication codes, max to prevent the parts from deviate from the protocol specification. And the max that uh, we'll be using the scheme that uh, we consider in our implementation is actually similar to the one that from speeds. It's a very famous MPC scheme nowadays. 
Okay, so in addition to the computations over secret shares of data, the parts also perform computations required for the max. Uh, that's the main thing. But uh, and when you move to the setting of uh, four parts uh, with one malicious corruption, uh, we actually use a different underlying scheme, uh, similar but a little bit different. Uh, that's due to the fast four paper that just appeared on uh, Usenix uh, a few months ago. And the main thing that I have here, they have a replicated secret share now, but uh, each part, each of the four parts receives uh, three shares. So we still have this problem that uh, any single part cannot recover, but two of them can recover, right? And the main thing is that they, they in this fourth uh, part setting, they have a joint message passing protocol that if, uh, let's say that Alice and Bob, they have a common uh, message U, and they want to send this message to Charlie. And they can send this message to a third part in such a way that if some things go wrong, the one or two parts will be detected. And uh, out of these one or two parts that were detected, one of them is the malicious part. So you, for instance, let's say that something went wrong and then uh, the parts can find that either Bob or Charlie is the malicious part. And then uh, they randomly pick one of them and exclude from the computation and convert to this uh, previous uh, replicate secret share for three parts that we had to continue the execution. And now they continue the execution as previous and uh, if there is another problem again, then they know for sure that the part that was identified uh, previously and was not excluded, it's the one that's exactly malicious one. So they can just move to a scenario of two PC and uh, have the part that was originally excluded helping. Okay, so, okay, that's about uh, the underlying NPC schemes that we use. Uh, it's a general overview. There are technical details that I will not have time to talk today. Okay, so, but as I mentioned, some of the building blocks we want to optimize. So in this uh, particular work, we will, we will use optimizations of a secure comparison protocol. That if you're giving six shares of X and Y, they just return one if uh, X is smaller than Y or zero otherwise. Uh, we also use a secure argument protocol that given a secret share vector, it returns the secret share of the index uh, that has the minimum value. Security quality protocol, similar to the comparison one and uh, secure division protocol for secret share values. All these building blocks are already existing in the literature and then, I mean, they have been subject of many works. Okay, so what we got here, I'm not entering into details of this first part of the protocol. Uh, I'll not have enough time, but uh, okay. The first part of the protocol is the protocol that do actually the, the secure future based on the, the feature score. So you have a data matrix D, which has the M instance and the, with all the P features. And then you have a vector G with the scores of each of the P features. And it outputs uh, a data matrix G prime, which has a smaller size, M, the, the original number of uh, input uh, that you have. And, uh, but uh, the number of columns is just K, just then uh, the final number of uh, features that you're selecting. I mean the, the, the I mean the protocol is quite straightforward using the argmin and the, doing some uh, one hot encoding but uh, yeah but the most important uh, thing it's uh, how you do the feature scoring and uh, because I mean in this protocol here we also already assume that uh, you have a vector g with the scores of each of uh, the p features okay so our idea was to use this mean split uh, Gini uh, scoring technique for the features. So you split the set of values of uh, each feature fj based on uh, its mean value as a threshold, where this threshold will be denoted by theta. Okay, so you have this set s uh, is smaller than or equal to theta, which denote the instance that have uh, the feature value is smaller than theta, then you have S uh, bigger than theta denotes uh, the set of instances that have the feature value bigger than theta. And then you have uh, the set LC, 
which is the set of examples from S that have a class label C. And then you can define the, the, the conditional probabilities of uh, PC is smaller than equal to theta, which is the probability of uh, if the element is part of uh, S is smaller than equal to theta, what's the probability that it belongs to the class C? In a similar way, you can define a PC for the case of uh, attributes bigger than theta. And then we use the traditional gene input uh, measures, which is just like computing one minus the sum of uh, the squares of these probabilities over all class. And uh, I mean, the, the this is the gene input for the case of uh, features smaller than or equal and for the case of uh, features bigger. And then the Gini score is actually just like the weighted average of these values based on the set, the size of uh, the both sets. Okay, this is a traditional Gini scoring, but uh, now how you do that in a privacy specific way, in an efficient way. So let's move to the protocol and see what we have done here. Okay, so what we have as input is a feature column. So now, instead of consider the whole data set, we just consider one of the one uh, of the features that correspond to one column of the original data set, and we want to compute the score of uh, this feature based on the on the Gini uh, technique. And uh, we also have as input a secret share of uh, one hot encoded version of the label value. So it's the label value encoded Z as a vector of zero and one, where it's zero in all place, except the place where, which denotes the class that it belongs to, which, where the value is one, right? Just traditional one hot encoding. And the out output that we want to get is a secret share of the score of F. Okay, so how, do we proceed? Uh, the first thing uh, we need to compute like uh, the split point. And as I mentioned, we use this mean split uh, Gini technique. So we just sum all the feature values in that column and divide by the number of uh, values that you had in that column to obtain the split point. It's uh, easy to do, right? Don't. It's not a expensive operation to do in a private space every week. And now you have to compute, I mean, so going back, we have to compute like all these terms here, the size of the sets that we use to compute for this probability so that we can proceed with the computation of the gene inputs and then the gene score. So what we do is the following. We have this counter, counters uh, A, B, C, A, vector A, indexed by J and uh, B indexed by J, uh, which will correspond to these uh, quantities that we are computing. And uh, when, whenever we are done with uh, this code that goes from uh, lines two to 14, we wanna have this property that uh, the value of A is equal to the size of uh, the set S uh, is smaller than or equal to theta, the B is equal to the size of the set S uh, bigger than theta and so on. Okay, so what do we do? I mean, we initially put the value of the counters as zero, and then we perform a secure comparison to determine whether the, the instance belongs to the set S bigger than theta or S is smaller than or equal to theta. That's what is happening in the line four here. It's just a secure, compare secure less than operation. Okay, so if we determine that uh, this value belongs to the set, then uh, in an oblivious way, we will update the value of uh, the counter B, which is the one, that, the, the appropriate counter that needs to be updated. The counter A will not explicitly compute at this point. We will just like compute it in a later stage in an indirect way to save operations. Okay, and uh, okay, supposing that uh, this instance belongs to S uh, bigger than theta, then we have checked to which class it belongs. But it needs to be done in an oblivious way as well so that we can update uh, vector B of J accordingly. 
And uh, we'll do that by using a secure multiplication operation and uh, then update you based on that. that that's some uh, kind of things that happen a lot when you want to do computation in a private specific way. You cannot like, have like if else kind of statements. So you, you use kind of uh, this, you get flags and uh, based on flags, you update values or not. That's quite common uh, kind of computation. And uh, I mean, we need to check, uh, okay, supposing if the, 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 instead of being from the set S uh, bigger than theta, it was from the set S is smaller than equal to theta, then we also need to check to which class it belongs and update the appropriate value of vector A. Uh, we just, we use some values here to the flag. We don't want to use one more multiplication here. So we just, we use the, these multiplications and uh, Okay, and we do some optimizations uh, to compute the less values of uh, the values, the vectors A and B without needing the nth iteration, especially if there are, I mean, if, if N is very big, that will save uh, only U a fraction uh, one divided by N. So that's not much, but if N is, uh, let's say two or three, that's saving you 50 uh, or one third of uh, the computation. So. Yeah, so you can use these optimizations to avoid uh, have to compute the less elements of the vector in an indirect way. Uh, okay, so if by the end of line 14, we have the values of discounters uh, that we compute using by some uh, secure comparison and secure multiplication operations, then we need to compute the Gini score. And the Gini score, uh, comes from this pre previous formula that we showed a few slides ago. It can essentially be computed using this line 15, 16, and 17. So what you are doing here, you are computing the inner product of uh, the vector A with itself, and then dividing it by the, the smaller A there. Similarly, you compute the inner product of B, uh, vector B by itself, and uh, divided by the small B. And then in line 17, what you are doing, you, you are just like uh, summing the, these two values. And we are ignoring this factor one uh, divided by M that we had in the previous formula because this will not change the relative ordering of the scores of the individual features. Okay, so that was an overview of what, what we have done there. And in terms of accuracy, so we analyze like in three data sets here. And uh, as you can see for this table, like uh, it shows the logistic regression for, for the case that you're using for the feature selection. I mean, so you, what we did here, we, we compare different feature selection techniques. And uh, after selecting the features, we, we execute logistic regression to have some comparison of uh, how good or bad the feature selection phase was. I mean, uh, we've run the same training phase uh, technique. So in the case of uh, the mean split regime, you can see that, uh, I mean, it's, accuracy, it's pretty much on par with uh, the, the traditional Gini index or PCC or mutual information. In some case, it's a little bit better, uh, but not much, uh, but it's clearly better than uh, just uh, not doing feature selection, which is the first column uh, raw. Okay, and uh, I mean, then you can ask, okay, but uh, why, uh, why did you do this uh, mean split Gini instead of uh, the original Gini? I mean, as I mentioned, uh, the mean split is to save uh, on, uh, computing time to have a more efficient solution. And uh, to benchmark that, uh, we also compare with a solution that's based on a uh, sorting, oblivious sorting and use the original Gini index. And as you can see, like the, the, the times increase by more than 10 times just uh, by doing that. Um, so you can, in some case, uh, 10 times, some case uh, five times, but increase a lot just and uh, if you see from the previous table, uh, I mean, the accuracy is pretty much the same. Sometimes even a little bit better, and uh, but you are safe for it on the features. I mean, all these benchmarks tests were completed on the 
three or four collocated uh, Azure virtual machines with three, 32 cores, six, five uh, gigabytes of memory. And uh, I mean, the network bandwidth was quite big, but uh, we call, we are considered like the communication times uh, here. It's not only the computational time, but uh, the communication time as well. So yeah, we compare with uh, some more standard gene index uh, based on oblivious sorting, which comes from the Usenix paper as well. Okay, some future directions. So it's quite important to develop a privacy preserving protocol for all the future scoring techniques and uh, as well like MPC protocols for tasks related to data pre-processing phase that is still need to be developed like uh, privacy solutions to deal with outliers or missing values or hybrid parameter optimization, all these kind of techniques. I mean, the goal in my view is that we, sh we should strive as research you have in uh, not so far future, a practical end to end framework for privacy preserved machine learning that covers all the steps necessary for realistic large scale applications. I mean, if you just focus on the training phase, but in real applications, you need to do all the data pre-processing. What's the meaning of uh, having to review all your data to do the data pre-processing, to get the clean data to do the privacy preserved training? Don't have any sense. You already revealed your data to do the data pre-processing. So yeah, you need to cover all the steps uh, necessary. And a few works uh, try to close this cycle and uh, this state of affair restricts the use of proposed solutions in practical applications. Another very interesting direction is exploring benefits from combined techniques from MPC and differential privacy. I mean, they provide most of the times like orthogonal guarantees and in some scenarios you need both of them. So you, and in some scenarios by combine both of them, you can get like good privacy guarantees with a better efficient trade-off. Yep, that is it. Uh, I'm looking for questions. Thank you. Okay, let me see. Oh, it was just three minutes walking. <laughs> Hello, Rafael. Uh, uh, nice uh, talk. So, any questions? I, I don't see any. So, okay, let me ask something. Um, so in the beginning, you mentioned that, yeah, you know, uh, some of the techniques are either focuses on MPC, like yep. the one you uh, okay. presented, um, yep. others yep. on DP, differential privacy, and others on yep. fully homomorphic encryption. Right. So when you design a new MPC-based approach. Do you compare your results with the D and uh, homomorphic encryption approaches or not? And what are I the mean, main differences in, in, in okay, so, terms of, I don't know, accuracy and efficiency? Okay, so you, I mean, full homomorphic encryption, uh, normally it's for two parts and so on, right? It's not for many computer parts uh, because, I mean, you'll be giving like your service uh, to someone to perform computations on top of it, right? The main thing here, it's like differential privacy uh, mechanisms. They normally, what are you doing? I mean, whenever you use them to get some uh, privacy guarantees, what you are doing is adding noise. So, I mean, Implicitly, you are already in like uh, decreasing the accuracy of the model. And how bad or how good that will be depends on the, the amount of noise that you're adding, right? But if you look at MPC techniques, they are not normally, I mean, if, if you just run the MPC for the very original ML technique without modifying it at all, the accuracy will be the same as running uh, the machine learning technique in the clip, right? It's, it's a bit different from the differential privacy where you are adding noise, so you, you are affecting the, the accuracy. So, but now, now the, the, the goal of MPC scheme is uh, it's like to have a lot of parts that they agree they want to compute one function without revealing the inputs, but they, they agree that they want to compute that function. 
And they agree, okay, this data should be released to, let's say, Alice, or this data should be released to all of us, just the output data, not, not the input, but the output, right? the model, let's say. Where in the case of GP, it's often the case that uh, maybe you're using GP mechanisms in the, for other purposes, like uh, let's say that Google itself computed a very powerful machine learning model, but uh, it cannot release the, data, the model without protecting the privacy of uh, the data of the users that it used. So the model is already trained and Google is adding noise to release the model to everybody without uh, revealing the, the, the underlying data. You see like in MPC, the parts agree that uh, the output, the model should be released and they don't want to release any information other than the output. I hope this clarifies a little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so as, as I mentioned, like in many scenarios, like what are you, I mean, you need to consider the scenario that you have or what is the application. Then in many scenarios, I think like when we move to more and more realistic scenarios and the data privacy laws will probably be becoming more and more strict in the next few years it will turn out that in many sensitive domains that you need to get data from many parts and then uh, somehow release them to some parts or in public, uh, then you would have to combine techniques from MPC and differential privacy. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a very interesting direction for future work. Okay, so then at some point you mentioned something about uh, privacy preserving video classification, which yep. I it's more or less similar to image or audio classification. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. I mean, so normally, I mean, nowadays, I guess, video classification is focused a lot on uh, convolution networks and this kind of things, right? Right, so, um, okay, when you want to classify in the privacy preserving way an image, I mean, I, I couldn't hear no. you. Sorry, Andrews. Sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of your question. Sorry. Right. So, when you want to classify in a privacy preserved way an image, for example, I would expect yeah. that uh, you know the most, let's say, privacy preserving way would be to encrypt that image, right? Uh, I mean, the, the question is, what do you want to do? Like, uh, well, what do you want to achieve, right? Okay, so can you give me a scenario with, by using MPC to classify an image? Because that's what I don't get. This. Because with, with encryption, I understand. I encrypt the image, I send it somewhere, and then without decrypting it, they tell me if that image contains whatever with a high probability, right? But so, I mean, how so the scenario of scoring, normally you have one part that owns the model, the, the, then the other part will have, uh, le let's say, one part has the model to classify the image and uh, the other part will have the image, right? But he, he don't want to send this message, the image, in the clear to the, the model on. So, I mean, for the scoring, the, there are many techniques based on uh, homomorphic encryption where you send the homomorphic encryption of your image and uh, the other part will manipulate it according to the model that it owns to obtain the, the result of the scoring. Or you can run MPC just to compute the, res the result of the scoring. Right, right, okay. I've got one more question, one last question. So I had a yeah. discussion with one of my PhD students lately uh, about, let's say the importance of keeping the model private. Yep. And so, I mean, from what you have seen, first of all, is it important or not? Or there are different cases where the model should be uh, kept private and other cases where the model should be publicly available. Honestly, or, depend on to the cloud service provider, for example. Honestly, I think it depends on the, on the model. I mean, if, if you use like sensitive data and you want to release uh, 
the, 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 the model in public, then it's one kind of uh, privacy issues that you have, right? On the other hand, you can have like, like uh, let's say like thousands of uh, participants that are providing their health data to try to to train a model to predict some disease and uh, all these users they are fine with the model being released to the hospital but not to the public in general so so the, the privacy issues are different right and they don't want to review their right. own data their complete data to the hospital but they are fine with uh, the hospital getting the fine model to predict the disease uh, it depend, depend, depends a lot on the, the, the setting that you consider, honestly. So it's important to get uh, solutions in all this setting, like federated learning, MPC, homomorphic encryption, uh, differential privacy. I mean, they, 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 they provide for different kind of settings and uh, needs. Yeah. Uh, I see okay, that Paul raised the hand here. Okay, yeah, I'll go for the question of Dave, but keeping secret the model, it's somehow a way of achieving secret Bob school. So, so the guarantee is that the model, so, uh, I mean, the guarantee here is, okay, all the parts will agree on who should get the model, right? So for instance, let's assume that uh, me, Antonis and Nicola, we have different uh, parts of data and we agree, okay, we want to compute this, model based on the data that all three of us have but it should be in such a way that only Antonis got the model Antonis will get the model in the clear he will be revealed the result of the model but in such a way that neither me Antonis or Nicola learns anything other than the, what can be inferred from our own inputs and outputs which in my case will be my original data in Nicola's case uh, for instance would be his original data and Antonis case will be the his original data plus the model because he's the one that's supposed to learn the model so it de depends on the setting that you want to use in some settings you want to review the final model to one of the parts in other the settings you want to review to all three parts uh, depends on your setting it's easy to adapt to any of the settings or you can even release the the result the final model in public Okay, thanks. So, end of session then. Thanks a lot, Rafael. That was really nice. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, yeah, hope we will meet soon physically. I know that you are, I mean, you are quite far away now, but yeah, anyway, I, hope. I don't know. I don't know when I'll be able to travel out of Australia now with this new Omicron. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we will have a 30 minute break. Uh, so, see you. Uh, at 11, 15, 18, right? Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.